Welcome to the Dice Tower, a series of video reviews about board and card games. Here are your hosts. Hey everybody, I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Z Garcia, hello. I'm Mike Delicio. And I'm Roy Kennedy. So, a few years ago, I reviewed a game that was on Kickstarter and did very well on Kickstarter, made a quarter of a million dollars called Unfair. This was about building an amusement park, following different themes. I reviewed the game and thought, man, I would have really liked this game, except I just could not handle the take that nature of the game. You would build up your amusement park and people would play negative cards on you. I was very obvious in the minority amongst a lot of people. The game did seemingly well. A lot of people said they thought it was very good. And then we got the game Funfair in. And I thought, this seems awfully familiar. It's <laughs> literally a very, almost the exact same game except they took out the take that, thus making it fun by their own words. I'm just <laughs> um, but, but that's what this is. It's a game about building an amusement park uh, with cards. There's a card drafting mechanism in it. And you know what? I'll just let Mike show you how to play it and we'll be back. In Funfair, you are gaining victory points by building the most impressive theme park and drawing customers to your park to give you money and ultimately points. And so the game plays out in a very simple structure that you have this nice player aid card to kind of help you through. So every round, what you're going to do is flip over this city card. This is also the timer for the game. There are six rounds in the game and there are six of these city cards. These are all going to do something good that are going to affect the different players. So in this case, it says a two for one deal. After you build a card from the market and complete any abilities, you can draw a park card. So this is something that gives you some boon and it affects all the players. Sometimes they'll be searching through the park deck, sometimes it'll let you build a card for free. So you flip that card over and then in turn order, players are gonna take three actions to begin with and if they build their showcase attraction with everyone, which everyone gets dealt to them face down, it's some type of a super attraction, costs a lot of money to build, but it's gonna immediately give you a fourth action. But before that's built, Generally speaking, you get these three actions, and there are a number of things you can do that are laid out here, again, on this card. So, you can build. The first thing that you can do is you can build a card from your hand. You start with a hand of five cards, and you also start the game with $30. When you build an attraction or an upgrade, uh, you can build it directly from your hand or from the market. So, let's say, for example, I wanted to build the, um, well, no, let's do this. Let's build an attraction. So I'm going to spend $6. I'm going to put this haunted castle here. All right. You have space for five attractions in your park. You'll never be able to have more than five attractions. However, once you've built an attraction, you can add to it. You can put upgrades on it. So maybe on a later turn, I want to put a, a, a flagpole on my haunted castle. So I would pay the $3. That's another build action. And now what I'm doing is I'm building up this attraction and I'm creating a list of icons. And these icons are gonna be used for scoring. Just having a certain number of icons will give you points, but there are also some cards that you get that are gonna be looking for particular types of icons, things along those lines, all right? So building is building from the market or from your hand. You can also do a take action, which is if you wanna take a card from the market, but you're not gonna build it right away, maybe kind of reserving it, you can go ahead and do that. Say, I'm gonna take this card and it gets replaced right away from the park deck. The other thing that you can do in a take action is you can draw two cards from this blueprint deck and you can keep either none of them or one of them. You can't keep both, but these are gonna be uh, secret goal scoring cards, okay? And so they're gonna give you a, a top portion, which you have to complete these or else you'll get a penalty at the end of the game. So if you choose to keep either of these cards, one or the other, you are now kind of stuck with that card. If you're able to complete the top half, you're gonna get a large number of points and you're also gonna be eligible for this bonus target. You can't complete this unless you've completed that. And again, you can have as many of these as you want, but they all have to be completed or else you're gonna get a ten, minus 10 point penalty at the end of the game. They also give you a little indication of how easy or difficult they are to complete. So perhaps I kept this easy card, it would be face down, for the purposes of this, I'm just gonna keep it face up, all right? So you can also, with this take action, you can discard uh, a card to draw five park cards and keep one. So it's a way to kind of cycle through. If there are particular cards you're looking for, it allows you to kind of burn through that deck and look for some certain cards. 
The other action you can do is a loose change action, which basically is you get one coin for each attraction in your park. Early on, it's not very exciting because you're only getting one. But if you've built multiple attractions throughout the game, that loose change gets a little bit better. Now I'm getting three coins for that uh, loose change. You can also demolish, which just means basically remove a card from your park, but you don't get anything for it. So in turn order, everybody is taking their three actions, potentially a fourth if they do build their kind of uh, what showcase attraction, couldn't remember the name of it. That also does count towards one of your five. So right now I'd have room for one more attraction I could build. And then you're going to do what's called the guest step. And this is where you're going to be getting income for the next round. You're going to count the number of stars or the numbers in the stars to determine how much money you get. Everyone starts with a main gate that gives them one. So in this case, I'd have one, two, four, six, eight, eleven. So I'd get eleven uh, for those uh, stars there. The other thing that you might do is throughout the game, you might hire these staff members. Now these go to the left of your park gate and they don't count towards the five attractions, but these generally are going to do a couple of things. They're going to give you some end game scoring, in this, uh, in this case three points, and they're also going to get you potentially some more coins during the guest step. Earn or gain three extra coins for each leisure ride in your park. So right now this uh, would get me, actually this would have been a great one for me because this would get me six extra coins. These are both leisure rides, all right? So that's the guest steps. The other thing that's going to happen during this point is if you had not built your showcase attraction at, during this point in the round, they're going to invest. They're going to put five coins on that, which makes it cheaper for you. You can only use these coins to pay to help pay for this card. So it basically makes it cheaper for you every round. Then you're going to have the cleanup step, which is basically going to be you clear and refill the market. So this market is going to get cycled through a whole lot. You're, you're not going to be stuck with cards here that you don't want because they're going to be cycled out quite a bit. And you can also burn through that park deck quite a bit by doing a take action. You discard down to five cards in hand, you move the starting player marker, and then you reset this. You're going to do that through six rounds, again, kept tracked by the city deck, and then you're going to go to scoring, and scoring is on the back of the card. So you're going to get points for each attraction based on the number of icons. So you simply will count the icons in each of them, and some of them have two, like this park attraction here, the Whirling Teacups, actually has two icons. That counts as two. You count those, you get points from there. You potentially get points from your blueprint cards. That would be when you're scoring those. You get points for coins that are left over. Two coins will equal one point. You can get points for those staff members that I've shown you. And then the awards. Now this is a randomly drawn card at the beginning of the game that gives you some global goal. So in this case, we flipped over the finest park award. Everyone's trying to build a park with the most quality icons, which this here is a quality icon. All right, you can see it right there. So whoever, whichever player has the most is going to get those 15 points. If it's tied, it's a friendly tie. Everyone would get them. There are a number of these different types of awards, most guest services, most theme icons, most feature icons, etc. All right, that's the game. Let's talk about the components. Okay, so generally speaking, I think that the components are well done. The cards are of fine quality. They are easy to read. The text is maybe a little bit small for people who have uh, eyesight like my own, but I didn't have any real issue with it. I felt like the iconography was clear. There was no real issue there. The little car that is your round tracker, or actually your phase tracker, is completely unnecessary and also completely adorable. I love it. I think that's great. The uh, money tokens are good. They're thick cardboard. You know, would they have been more impressive as poker chips? Absolutely. Would it have doubled the price of the game? More than likely. So I'm perfectly happy with those. Um, one nice touch here is that this board is, let's not make a huge mess here. This board is double-sided and it really is only for orientation. So if you're playing on the same side of the table, this board works well. If you are on sitting on opposite sides of the table. It's the same exact things on the board, but it's oriented a little bit differently so people on both sides of the board can more easily see things. So that's a nice little touch. The rules are good and clear. Uh, pretty solid all around on the components. All right, I really like the components of this game a lot. Mr. Cuttington, 
he's one of my favorite artists, especially for a theme like this. He does cute stuff for the most part. You know, he did mm. the cute things in Charterstone and in Santorini. And so here, he, you know, I'm thinking, who would I want to design a theme park? He's kind of on board there. And when I'm I look at you off really quick, because I think Mr. Cuddington is actually a husband wife team, Tom. I think it's two people. You're right. Well, it's called Mr. Yeah. It should be called the it's Cuddingtons odd. then. All right. Yes. So <laughs> I, know. I like their work then. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I like their work a lot. Um, I think they, it doesn't even look like their other work that they've done in the past. It doesn't look like the Chibis from Charterstone and right. mm -hmm. such, but it's just good. It, the whole thing has a very nice vibe to it. I also <clears> thought <throat> that the different symbols were not hard to figure out. The graphic design, I, I'm very happy with the component quality of this game. I agree with that. I'll, I'll focus specifically on the uh, graphic design because I'm a big stickler for a lot of that. I think good graphic design goes a long way into making something easy to understand, visually appealing, all of that. And I thought the graphic design here, the iconography usage, the positioning of information on the cards is very strong. It, it lets you you know, slide cards behind cards and sort of thematically build something also. So you can look at something and go, oh, it's a pirate-themed, uh, you know, cinema with reclining chairs or a bathroom or whatever. So the way that works out is really neat. I just like the, yeah, the, the visual design of it all the best. That's my favorite part about it. Yeah, and I did the kind of overview of the components, so I won't add too much more other than this is a game where you have to very pretty quickly look at a large number of icons to be able to tell kind of what your scoring possibilities are. And I would kind of parrot this idea that it's all very clear and I never had any real issues yeah. about trying to tell what I was going for, how I was doing in any particular area. That's crucial in a game like this where so much of it is based around iconography. I never ever had a situation where I was unclear about how something worked. Uh, Roy, what were your thoughts on the icons, art, et cetera? Yeah, I thought the quality of everything was really good. It was, like you guys said, it was easy to read. And, of course, card stock and everything was great. It seems like most of this game is mostly the cards and manipulating all yeah. those. And all that stuff worked great. Of course, you have coins that you're moving back and forth as you're paying for things and gaining more money in between turns. But, yeah, I thought all of the different components and parts in the iconography all were sufficeable. So let's talk a little bit. I'm, I think I'm the only person here who's played Unfair. Um, but Unfair itself was, like I said, very similar game. What this game does differently is, first of all, there's an, the event deck here. I, as, I think they're all very positive. They're all like, hey, everyone gets free money, mm -hmm. gets a free ride, gets this fun stuff. And they took out the take that cards. Now, they also did make this a slightly more condensed game because the original game and its expansions had various theme decks. And you just shuffle those together. Like I'm playing with the vampire deck and I'm playing with the the Western theme, then the future, and you put those together. And this has some of those themes in, Z mentioned Western, and I, there's a few other themes in here, but I do miss that. I wish they had kept that different decks and you could you know, pick four of them and build a deck. But I don't miss the take that at all. I, I like building up my own ride, trying to build up the number of attractions and this huge, awesome ride, or maybe make a bunch of little ones without having someone else mess it up. And I'm curious if you think, if you all think that you would want more take that in the game. I don't. I thought that was fine. It's the kind of game that you, you know, you build up your own thing. You try to achieve your scoring goals without really being too concerned about what anybody else is doing. I don't think, uh, I don't remember there being a lot of sort of interaction or worrying about you know what everybody else is doing maybe they'll take something you want to take you know mm -hmm. there is that but that's that's most games mm -hmm. that have any kind of interaction whatsoever uh the pressure sort of comes from you know how much time do you have to get everything you want to get achieved achieved that's you know sort of where that's at mm -hmm. I, um and yeah i like the idea I never did play unfair but i do like the idea of there being extra themes and all of that in this one uh that would have been really neat. Maybe a little harder to balance the whole thing. But that sounds like a cool idea. But no, I like the... Mechanically, this is not a very interactive game. But what is there, for the most part... I'll come back to one thing that I really wasn't a big fan of. But for the most part, what is there works well. 
Yeah, and, and I would echo that. I also, everything that you're describing, Tom, comparing unfair to funfair, sounds to me like it was an improvement. And I even would include not having those theme decks. That's just from my own taste as far as to me, that's one less thing I have to worry about in setup. I don't have to like try to sort through cards and figure out oh, which ones are gonna be in this game. You basically have one deck of cards. The setup is super quick. You can get it going really quickly and easily. And, and for a game of this length, of this experience that you're getting, I don't want to spend 15 minutes setting the game up looking through decks of cards. So I understand that it's limiting the replay value of it. And, and so I can see, you know, expansions coming out that add those things. But I don't know that I mind just keeping it a finite deck of cards so that I could just pop them out there on the board every time. So, uh, and to take that, I would be very annoyed if I was spending four, five, six turns to build up this great ride and someone could just wreck it by playing a card. So I want no part of that. Yeah. Oh, for sure. I, I agree that uh, I didn't play uh, Unfair, but I definitely think that this, this was a lot more like, it felt streamlined as far as like this style of game goes. And it was very pleasant overall. I mean, there is a little bit of like, oh my goodness, there's like shared goals a little bit. So there's like a goal mm -hmm. that you're both, all the players are going after. And like me and Mike played a game where quality was the goal we're going after. So when qualities <laughs> ended up in the row, it was like, oh my goodness, I gotta grab the quality before the other player does. I'm gonna try to race them to that. But then also like the game has answers and solutions to that. You can also, you're choosing a lot of the cards you're playing in your hand, which ones you're gonna play, which ones you're gonna keep, which ones you're gonna discard to be able to like dig through the deck. And you can do a lot of right. digging through that deck as well. And I really enjoy that because it allows you to try to like build the game the way you want to, to, to fulfill your blueprints. And it gives you the options to do that successfully. And I think the game is great at that. Yeah, building on that, what Roy said with the blueprints, that's, I like that part of the game. It's a typical thing, you know, Ticket to Ride has it, complete the ticket or lose points. Mm -hmm. You can draw blueprints until at a certain point the game says you can't take blueprints anymore. Right. And, but you better complete those. The game has a really tight economy. At the beginning mm -hmm. you're thinking, I'm never gonna get enough money to build anything. <laughs> but the events help, for one, and then you will slowly build up to where you can afford stuff but then sometimes you're looking for that one perfect card that completes your blueprints and helps you go over the other person for a goal. And I thought it all came together pretty well. It's a family game, probably. I don't think gamers will be disappointed by it, though. Mm -hmm. There's a lot going on in a single deck of cards, really. I think there is a lot going on, and I don't know. I think it may be maybe family plus, because it didn't... Okay. I don't know if I can bring... Uh... I don't know how comfortable I would be bringing in like you know eight year old uh, uh, Tiffany or you know whoever. It seemed a little more, I said you know a lot of text on the cards and building patterns and or at least you know sets and all this stuff. So I agree, you could play maybe with a family helping perhaps the younger members of that family, but it's a little there's a little more there than I expected. When I first saw that cover, when I, I saw the theme, and that's something to be aware of. This is not a game you buy for the kids and then just hand to them, okay? Right. You're going to have to jump into that, help them along the way, if that's the idea. And I like the blueprints. It's actually one of my favorite things, because it gives you guidance. Right? right. Any game that has that sort mm -hmm. of idea of, hey, here's something to complete, and, and that's what you should be trying for, and a little go above and beyond area underneath that which i really liked i liked being able to get it done or put in a little extra oomph and get extra points out of that now if i'm not mistaken i don't remember exactly how the events work but i, I believe that it is one of the things that i didn't really like i thought they were just sort of i felt like one of the things that didn't do anything uh you flipped it and everybody got the same amount of stuff or didn't or it just seemed like a part of the game that um, they were trying to inject maybe some thematic happenings into it, and they really didn't do anything. It seemed pointless. Mm. I just thought they, they, they felt like happiness. Like, oh, we all get a free something. I don't know. I just like that sort of thing. Okay, got it. So, I no, I dislike that. I thought that was <laughs> thought that Now, was I will dumb. say that those... That was the, an extra step. They could have been... Sometimes they'll say, you know, draw the top card and you get a certain one that costs this much or less, and I get a good one and you get an okay right. one. So there's a right. bit of that, but I didn't think it was that big of a deal. 
Yeah, there is a fair amount of luck. Right. Anytime you have games Mike, that are based around, think? yeah, I just I was going to say there's there's a fair amount of luck, and, and you're going to expect that in a game where there's a lot of flipping cards. Mm -hmm. And like Tom said, you know, if you happen to get an event that gives you the exact card you need that's going to fulfill a blueprint, and someone else doesn't, that could be a little bit frustrating. But overall, I felt like the 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 weight of the game is I would agree family plus. I think that it. Um, it has the right game length too. That's something that I that I probably think is important to point out is that this is a game that I think and you maybe alluded to it, Tom, in, in unfair maybe that it played a bit longer. I feel like this game was just where it should be. I think it might have overstayed its welcome if it had gone on another couple of rounds. I feel like you have basically what those five attractions and then that's it. You you're gonna build those five attractions. You you hope. I think that's your your kind of maximum. Uh, but I think every time I played, everyone has built all of their attractions that they could. Um, so yeah, I, I feel like the game is one that kind of does exactly what it lays out to do. It has a cute theme. It's a little bit above entry level kind of, uh, what are we calling them? Welcoming games. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's a little bit above a welcoming game, but, uh, a little bit of luck of the draw. I think it sets out, it does what it sets out to do very well. Roy, what do you think? Yeah, I think, I think it also has ways to, I mean, the fact that it allows you to dig through that deck and things like that, it helps you mitigate that a little bit by trying to find exactly what you need for your stuff. And I, I really enjoyed the fact of the whole building up your, your money. Like Tom said, the economy is really, really tight in the game, and it seems like you don't have a lot. And at first, when, when Mike was explaining the game to me, he's like, oh, you can do this loose change action. And I'm like, you're only going to get a couple coins for that. Well, near the end of the yeah. game, a couple coins or like three or four coins is all you really need. It's like, I can play this yeah. one thing, and that's going to fulfill the blueprint, and everything comes together. And it just gives you this feel of like scraping by, but getting these attractions out and fulfilling what you have. And when you look back, it's like, look at this thing that I built. Um, and that was one of the things I really enjoyed about the game. Yeah. All right, Z, what's your final rating and thoughts? So for me, this is going to get a 7 out of 10, okay? And there's a few things that go into that. I like the 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 cadence of the game. It does feel very tight, and you do always feel like, I need one more turn, come on! I like that. But the events were dumb. That should have been left on the cutting room floor, in my opinion. I like the blueprints quite a bit. Overall, though, this game is like a nice, pleasant painting or a good meal and then once i've moved away from the painting and i'm done looking at it i'm thinking that's nice or i'm done eating that meal and i am driving somewhere i'm not thinking about it anymore this is the game if you put it in front of me and you're like hey you want to play fun fair i'm like yeah yeah let's play and i will then forget about it all right mike i don't know yeah. what that is but that's kind of how i feel about it apathy is what it is okay <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm in a similar place to you, Z. I'm actually coming in a little bit lower. I'm coming with a 6.5, and the main reason is that while it's a pleasant game, I feel like really the main hook for it is the theme and the art, and that's nice. But this is a crowded genre. You know, this 45-minute, family weight slightly above, card-driven game, set collection. There are so many of them out there. Why am I going to choose this one over five, six, seven others that I like more. And so I think that if this theme really appeals to you, really, right. really appeals to you, and the art really appeals to you, then maybe it will be the one you choose. But for me, I come in just under a recommendation on it because there are some issues, some gamery things. Z mentioned one. I also don't love the idea of there's this super attraction that you can get and it gets cheaper every time. It can basically become free. That just felt like a gamery rule to me. I didn't know why it was there. Mm -hmm. All of those things keep me just under recommenda recommendation. Pleasant game. I don't love it, though. All right. Roy, what about you? I'm actually at a 7. Um, I, I was surprised that I my score is higher than Mike's is um, because I thought he seemed to really enjoy the game. But uh, I enjoyed it. I thought it was good. I, I really liked building up. I like games that allow you to, like, build up, like, the money that you're earning per, per turn. And you have a little bit of, like, a, it feels almost like a little bit of an engine. But then you have, like, these mm -hmm. other characters that you can get that are, I guess, the hosts of the attraction. They can help multiply that as well. And then you're building out all these different stuff and trying to figure out the right blueprints, like, which thing am I working towards here and trying to 
to make themes fit with everything. I thought it all came together. This is not a theme that I'm super huge on. Like if it was a theme that I was really excited about, I feel like it could be even higher with almost the same mechanics. But I know other people might really enjoy this theme as well. So if you're into that, I think the game is solid. So it's definitely a seven for me. I think I'm going to give this one an eight. Um, oh. I really, I mean, I'm biased towards the theme. Mm -hmm. Right. You like, like I, I mean, everything that, that Mike theme. is saying that he's missing, and I'm, I'm, I don't really a big fan of the theme either. Those things that the two of us are missing, and Roy to a certain degree, you have, and you kind of enjoy yeah. those things. Yeah. I so I like the theme, and also I was rebounding off of unfair to a bit, but mm -hmm. I also like the whole collect stuff and decide mm -hmm. whether you want to build one giant ride or if you want to build the other ones. And I think that gamery thing that Mike mentioned where the big ride gets cheaper, I like that because it introduces that kind of thing, but it's not that difficult to understand for people. Oh, you can build it your big ride now or build it later. And also I like that big ride because everybody felt cool as in, well, at least I built one big ride. <laughs> you built that one big thing and that just brings that theme home. My only disappointment is like I said, I feel like the game's smaller than I want it to be. I want this to mm. be a game where I can bring in those extra things. That would be fun. Mm. And that extra stuff, because I'm my concern, and this keeps me from giving it an excellent, would be I'm not sure how many times I would play this. Mm -hmm. Right? Like how many times I'm going to play the same game. There's a lot of different blueprints and stuff, but I'll see all them after a few games. There's a lot of different combinations of cards. And that the cool thing about Unfair was it had all that stuff in it. So that might be, that might make the game better. But as it is, I think that we could use a lot more amusement park theme games myself, frankly. There's way, there's more zombie games than there is amusement park games. Sure. And more people go to amusement parks than watch zombie movies. Fact. Anyhow, I don't know if it's a fact or not, but it seems true. Sure, why not? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, there you go, folks. That's what we think of uh, Fun Fair. Um, check it out for yourself. But until next time, I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Z Garcia. I'm Mike Delicio. And I'm Roy Kennedy. Have fun giving money to Disney World. <laughs>